हेलो सर्वानंद एंड ओलंपियाड स्टोरीज विथ सर्वानंद कंटिन्यूस सर्वानंद सागर शाह कंटिन्यूस यू नो एवर सिंस वी स्टार्टेड डूइंग दिस ओलंपियाड स्टोरी थिंग मोर देन द करंट ओलंपियाड माय माइंड कीप्स ऑन गोइंग बैक टू द प्रीवियस ओलंपियाड्स यू नो इन दैट ओलंपियाड दैट हैपेंड दैट ओलंपियाड यू नो 1986 दुबई ओलंपियाड देयर वाज अ प्लेयर फ्रॉम कोयंबटूर मिसेस पीवी निर्मला शी वाज वन ऑफ माय मेंटर्स शी वाज यू नो वन ऑफ माय अर्लीएस्ट कोचेस अ वेरी नाइस पर्सन she played the dubai olympiad then she brought all the bulletins those days you know after each and every round a bulletin would be produced with stories and all it was one of the best chess literatures i have ever read it's a tragedy that those kind of uh, publications are not uh, you know compiled and published mm. it will be very good if someone does, does that like this you know so many small small memories of the olympiad keep coming back to me yeah and you have so many olympiads like we spoke about vishi uh, in the olympiad we we spoke about jude that 88 olympiad we spoke about kasparo in 82 olympiad uh, the next one is which one uh, at which olympiad and who is the personality my one other hero of the olympiads is definitely vladimir kramnik mm-hmm. i would love to talk about him. you know kramnik burst into the world stage at the manila olympiad 1992 what a performance eight and a half out of nine what a performance you know something in that olympiad percentage wise performance rating wise you know who was the second in that olympiad at board if, one or in, in general if i tell the board you'll guess very easily <laughs> see a uh, kramnik was a uh, reserve board number 1 mm. so in all the other boards combined after kramnik the best chess performance was by gary kaspar oh. no one remembers that because you know kramnik's performance was so mesmerizing 29 38 or something wow. that was his wow. performance rating 94 percentage 8 and a half out of 9 board one actually was 8 and a half out of 10 by gary gasparov but kramnik took the world by storm in that olympiad there is this beautiful book published by caster hansel his uh, manager hmm. on kramnik that there are some photographs of uh, kramnik one of them he is smoking a cigar obviously in the bar enjoying a wine in the evening bohemian lifestyle that's a caption given to that photograph you know that vladimir kramnik with the long hair and you know scoring eight and a half cross nine in the process defeating john nun in a brilliant game in the last mm. round i can never forget this game sir the way kramnik burst into the world scene amazing i think he was just 19 right at that point or maybe he was 17 maybe 73 uh, so 92 so he was i guess 18 or 19 years old at that point and he was not even a grandmaster perhaps right he had not got his title and and the thing about kramnik that i know is that he did not become an im long hair and you know you know today vladimir kramnik speaks speaks and we all listen to his wisdom and his uh, deep knowledge and insight of chess hmm. but that was an olympiad that was a kravnik i that photograph stays in will stay in my memory forever this one yeah, yeah? oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> look at him <laughs> so he's 17 years old at this point look at him you know like he is just so confident he's walking uh, on the stage i think long and... hair long, <laughs> long hair, hair. <laughs> I I think he was not even uh, selected for the team right in terms of rating he was brought in by Gary Kasparov Kasparov hand picked him basically you know and he was made as a reserve one and he more than justified those games when they were published it was obvious that we had a special talent in our midst see that team if i remember it was uh, Kasparov Halifman Dolmato Kramnik Dreev and Vishmanavin, correct? I think mm. these were the six in the Olympiad. Sure. Mm. Yeah, other, I mean, others were kind of veterans and well-established Russian players. It was Russia already in 1992. Amazing to bring a 17-year-old. I mean, you are almost putting your uh, reputation online. Correct. Mind you, there was no Anatoly Karpov in the team. But there was Kramnik in the team. What a performance, simply. Brilliant. Yeah, but... 
I mean, at that by that point, I think Kramnik was known to Kasparov because he was working in this Kasparov Botwinik school, right? Yeah, 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 very good. Yeah. So he must have seen his talent. But this is also another thing about Gary, right? He kind of uh, gave this opportunity to Kramnik, who went on to become, of course, he would have become one of the best in the world. And later on, he did beat Gary itself of eight years later. See, that's what uh, it is considered as one of the tactical mistakes that Kasparov did in his career to bring in Kramnik as one of his seconds for his match against Anand in 1992. 95, right? I'm sorry, 95. Mm. Sitting next to Kasparov, Kramnik learned all the tricks of the trade. That's what basically they say. It was one of the tactical mistakes, but of course, you know, uh, Kasparov always, always uh, patronized uh, Kramnik as started with this Olympia. So who can fault him at the end of the day? And, and we all got a genius for the chess world, thanks to Kasparov. I think one of the things about Kramnik, which I have seen over the years, and he has had a very long career, is his ability to kind of switch his styles of play. Like at every point, he would have this style of, I don't know what was it at 92, maybe we'll look at his games right now and you can tell it better. But I knew that at some point he had become like ultra positional. He was playing these Catalans and very strong positionally. And then towards like 20... 12 or 2013 and so on onward he started playing e4 once again and he was like i want to once again ignite that uh, attacking uh, style in my play end games and of course what you said is correct and then end games kramnik's end games in my opinion the biggest strength of kramnik was his ability for research and his ability to put up openings on the world stage, which were championed by him, which were invented by him. Hmm. You know, there is this interesting theory. Let us go back to Kasparov Kramnik World Championship match in 2000, yeah. 2000. What's the main reason, do you think, Kramnik won this match, in your personal opinion? Yeah. The the Berlin, right? This is the basically what this is basically what everyone yeah. says, the Berlin difference. Does, does anyone remember what did Berlin Kravnik played with the black pieces? With the white pieces, what was that opening which Stonewall Kasparov's kings in there? Does anyone remember? Did, did he play uh, the Zemish at that point? It was the bayonet attack. Ah, the bayonet. Oh, okay. Classical uh, variation. Yes. According to many top grandmasters, Kasparov could never crack Kravnik's bayonet attack. So with black pieces, he missed one of his biggest weapons. So in that 2000 match, basically, he had to go back to the Grunfeld defense. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he didn't employ a single game of Kings Indian defense. I should have said ah, right. uh, the black because, weapon, which was not present. Mm, because because I, I know present. he played the Grunfeld there. Yeah. I was not. Ah, so he didn't play because uh, Kramnik was very good with the bayonet. Exactly. He shunted Kasparov's Kings Indian defense with the Bayern. There is a very interesting observation by Lev Sackers. He asked Kasparov somewhere in the late 90s, why have you stopped playing the Kings Indian? Okay, Kasparov did openly admit it is due to Kravnik's Bayonet. He said, to play Kings Indian on a daily basis, to find resources in places where it appears so gloomy for black, what you need is, in Russian, the word is Kharosh. Karosh translated, translated into English as something like Courage. inspired guts. Mm. Inspired guts. A little different from courage. You know, you have to be gutsy because all the time you are almost, your back is against the wall. Uh, playing against a huge, huge space advantage for white. And what appears to be a bad bishop all the time on G7 if the center gets closed. Even the mighty Kasparov had to quit the King's Indian because of Kramnik's violent. And then came the Berlin defense. Before that, Kramnik had employed the Petrov defense, Petrov very well. Like this, so many inventions over the years. As mm. Vishy Anand said, we all play Vlad's openings. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, Kramnik brought something very fresh to the table, you know. See, no doubt Kasparov was a researcher on the chessboard. Kasparov has resurrected so many openings. Cecilia Nidoff will always live as an opening which was championed and promulgated by Kasparov. But at the same time, this is a little different. The mm. Berlin difference, the bayonet, etc. It's a little more subtler than just coming out with guns and bang, bang, bang like the Nidoff. There is a profound strategy there. And one of the other reasons why 
Kasparov lost the match in 2000 was he should have simply quit E4 and gone to C4 or D4. Mm. But knowing Kasparov's you know, steadfastness to stick to something, that was also part of Kravnik's strategy. And yeah. we got a new champion in Kravnik. But what would you say is the reason why Kramnik was so good at making these new systems? Uh, many say that he had this chess brain, right? All the time he was thinking about different things, different ideas, thinking about his opponents. But that is that is there for almost all the world champions. See, that's the point. You have players, you have inventors, you know, and you have people like Carpo. Who, who don't belong to both, who operate in a kind of an intuitive and spider-like web-creating qualities. See, for example, in the 80s and 90s, whenever the informant, chess informant would come, that was the opening manual for all of us. You know whose games I would look at first? Okay, leave Carpo Kasparov. You leave the top, you leave your heroes. We would go for two, three players whom we used to admire a lot. One was Igar Gluck. Okay. Another was Alexei Driu. The reason was they always invented something new. You understand? Because, you know, their games would contain something new in an opening in which you thought it was not possible to invent something new. For example, the Kings in and Defense with Black Pieces. Gleck invented these systems starting with Knight A6. Mm. So it is D4, N of 6, C4, G6, Knight C3, BG7, E4, D6, Bishop E2, Castles, BG5. The Averbach system, Gleck invented Knight A6. Then came H3, E4, D6, H3, castles, BG5, Knight A6, the Gleck system. Before that, it was almost standard before the 70s and 80s to bring the knight to the D7 square. Even mm. Kram, uh, Kasparov did this against Kramnik in, in many of those uh, blitz matches they had and all that. This is that inventive, inventing quality in certain players which I admire the most. Of course, guys like uh, whom you can say in the current have taken it to a completely different level today. Yeah. Guys like Duda and you know, Rapport, maybe. Rapport. They have taken it to a completely different level. Especially with computers, now you have more and more openings where you can experiment and all that. But in those days when information was sparse, to think, to invent something, come to the board, execute it, and then stand by your yeah. invention. This standing by the invention no longer, I think, exists now. It's more like you do something, you create, then you go to the next one. It's like, it's the same way we speak about uh, the information, right? We spoke about that, how the information was savored before, like a good story was savored. Now it's like these bits of information which come in the form of tweets, little reels, shorts. The same way the openings also are moving that way. Like you create a new idea, it works in a game, you can't use it again because the engines will show a line to equalize. You have to move. You have to move. And Danny Dubo. Danny Dubo is the first name which comes to Correct. mind when you say this. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So, so maybe that's how it's changed. But Kramnik was from that era where you could, you know, uh, hold your own. Uh, you could make opening strategies. Then it would go on for years. The debate would go on. He would find little nuances and it kept on going and going. He has changed the whole landscape, right? Yeah. I mean, Whoever plays E4 has to dread the Berlin today. <laughs> and most of the opening preparation and today Catalan, revolves no? around... With white. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so many. You can keep on going about the Kramnik. At some point, the Sveshniko even. I mean, fantastic chess player, I would say. So, we uh, go to his game against Nun. That's your favorite, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yes. Okay. And uh, he's playing with the white pieces. This was the last round. Of the tournament? I think the penalty meant. Okay. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 14th round. So d4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, e4. Like maybe at that point, uh, they no one knew that he was like this king's Indian killer. Yeah, at that in 92. <laughs> Seven, of course, he was 17 years old. He was an unknown commodity. Completely. And John Nunn was, of course, one of the best players at that point. Yeah, actually, John Nunn was one of our childhood heroes. You know, John Nunn, again, was an inventor. And he was a very dazzling player with a very, very attractive style. The English attack against the Nidoff and most of the Sicilians basically was a result of, you know, Nunn, Chandler and Nigel Shaw at mm. the time. So Nunn, Nunn had his fortresses. None had his strong points at that point. 
this game was very cru- very uh, curious for us because how a king's indian specialist was kind of butchered with with the black pieces against a young vladimir kraft right and he goes for the sap and shop is there so castles bishop e3 and c5 which is very interesting because uh, i think at that point also they knew that giving up this pawn uh, gives black good compensation on the dark squares so take take and kramnik did accept the challenge he took the queen and then took the pawn knight came to c6 this is a well known gambit from those days basically even in a queenless middle game black has a huge compensation because of the bishop on g7 and the dark squares and the uh, development advantage in general this was basically a fantastic game right so bishop a3 he played a5 continuing the play on the dark squares maybe yes. idea of knight b4 somewhere uh so rook d1 was played bishop e6 connecting the rooks and now knight jumped to d5 yeah see this is another uh, thing about kramnik's play most of the moves look so natural when they get played mm. you know they there is this beautiful quote by uh, alan lamb the english cricketer about azharuddin's batting mohammad azharuddin's batting for azhar cricket is just like eating he just goes there and does it that's all mm-hmm. like that pieces move very very fluently for vladimir kramnik this is something i always admired but his ability probably lay in choosing of the right harmonious way to play so these two games we are going to discuss today of kramnik this is what i would suggest everyone should look at look how naturally pieces move and he gets an advantage especially with white pieces seamless right. completely seamless and also like if you see him even analyzing till this date there is a very big clarity in the way he analyzes uh, yes. he's not like confused because of the engine evaluations which happens to many great players now they are always like you know oh i don't know whether this is happening that which is natural but kramnik has his firm beliefs and he sticks by them even if the computer is going the other way many times there is a story with vishi told me there was a very early game of vishi against karpo and karpo is completely losing completely lost and he suddenly doesn't make his last move there is almost nothing to play he has to make a move a couple of moves and then he resigns that's what is going to happen and then karpo takes a very very deep thought very deep let's say 10 to 15 minutes or so vishi is like what's happening a very young vishi okay after two moves he resigns and then proceeds to show where he was winning then vishi realized in the 10 minutes he was thinking where he missed the win so that he can show anand after the game <laughs> you can't call this search for truth over the board hmm. in analysis see sashi kiran among indian grandmasters is one of those who is a very very firm believer in search for truth in analysis most of the time in analysis he looks for search for truth for a, sitting next to him and analyzing i kind of learned the art of analysis in the later parts okay this ability of search for truth is a very very important quality in a chess player but it is also a quality which is missing in many chess players because you know by nature chess players are extremely aggressive especially when they lose a game very difficult for them to admit they have lost a game correct i think kramnik is one of them who is brilliant when it comes to search for truth over the board in analysis mm. so here knight d5 nun takes pawn takes and puts his knight on b4 attacking the a2 pawn and uh, kramnik now just puts his bishop on b5 yeah this is the part where a very curious fact of nun's personality came out I told you Nana was a very aggressive player who has created many beautiful games. This was not a position where he should have played for activity. Mm. But the problem in John Nana is he has to play for activity as a personality. So later on analyzing this position analyzing this game a lot of theories came out that Black should have played knight e8 here. Ah here. Yeah here. The point of knight e8 is you come out knight d6. Mm. shut out the light square bishop from b5 and then bring the rook to c8 and you are kind of gradually coming towards white position instead of acting immediately mm. but the problem with john nun is he couldn't contain himself from playing actively here mm. nice to check check king f2 and then take the run 
yeah took see and took in effect it uh, it looks as if it's very good because you you removed the dark square bishop which is uh, which is black's force on g7 this is basically where kramnik took over the game beautifully yeah he played the move e6 here and now uh, kramnik played a very nice move d6 and i think nan thought that he will be able to round up this pawn with e5 now it's kind of weak knight e2 bishop f8 attacking the pawn so d7 keeping the pawn and now he won the a3 pawn and almost the insignificant a3 pawn yeah, yeah. and until this point the game was played between van der steren and shiro right uh, before so this is the first point where the new move was found by kramnik and i think it was a very strong new idea g4 yeah g4 yeah h6 h4 a4 rook to d3 bishop yeah, this b2 this was this was the next point somewhere around here the whole game revolved around where is kramnik going to break through because okay you have the d7 pawn you have it very firmly planted okay he is trying to do something on the king side so when we analyzed this game for the first time i very well remember a group of people we were analyzing this game me ts ravi kongwel we were analyzing this game the idea kramnik found here to actually break through was simply brilliant mm. i mean it was kind of what could you say textbook way of pawn breaks uh, by the way kramnik considers pawn breaks to be a very very important skill to develop in chess which is almost never dealt with in many of the chess treatises you will find on that this game i really like the way he crashed through somewhere from here so he went uh, bishop b2 g5 opening up the position takes yes. takes and now knight h7 you have to think about how to defend the g5 pawn now but kramnik went forward with f4 but but if i take like let's yeah. say if i take e takes f4 isn't the g5 pawn still hanging yeah this is the point here i go rook d5 oh, i okay. support g5 the point of rook d5 is if you don't do anything i'm going to just continue king f3 and knight f4 and you know straight knight f4 whatever so for rook d5 you basically try to come to e6 square or something by playing knight f8 mm. I continue with knight f4. Now the strength of the g5 pawn and the d7 pawn and the dominating pieces of white gives him a very clear advantage. Right. So you know that f4 basically was okay. The game continuation is even more attractive, probably because none didn't believe in this. You know, playing f4, e f4, rook d5, white again, getting a hold on the position. Mm. This is where my most favorite part came. instead of taking he played rook a5 rook a5 yeah. attacking the bishop and uh, I, i mean kramnik goes ahead with his plan rook d5 see that's the point if kramnik had not seen his this idea that he is going to play he couldn't play f4 yeah and without this continuation f4 wouldn't play. that was the beauty of this whole position in my opinion then f6 so finally like nan is trying to break down everything right uh, because otherwise as we just saw e takes f4 would lead to a very passive position where nothing much is moving for black so he played f6 and in came a powerful move now maybe people can pause here and think what should white do beautiful yeah and he takes yes. king takes g takes f6 and now he wants to take on e5 so e takes f4 but e5 nonetheless and suddenly you have three passed pawns in the center out of nowhere that's what you know from just the strength of the d7 pawn look what has happened suddenly because of a beautiful imaginative bit of play this game was simply wonderful this probably announced to the whole world as here comes a huge talent in a completely different level of understanding of chess on his queening and he resigned also i think if king g7 f8 and knight g6 yeah it finishes it beautiful game beautiful uh, there are a couple of more pictures here of kramnik like one is this one which they won from here we can see from left to right extreme left is uh, sergi dolmato Mm. one of uh, dwaritsky's products right uh, the great dwaritsky's product next is of course gary kasparov the one holding the cup is an official next to him is halifman alexander right. halifman another huge talent in the right middle is florencio campomanes <coughs> the erstwhile president of the world chess federation 
and then of course vladimir kramnik with long hair the next is vishwanavin and on the extreme right is alexey driv driv halifman dolmato these were brilliant players who if they had not started their careers in the soviet union probably they would have become much much stronger players because of you know more opportunities to travel and play more and all that in my opinion yeah yeah i had once spoken to doretsky who said that maybe drev was the most talented player he had ever seen when he was young but of course he had some drawbacks which stopped him from becoming the world champion you know he reached i think world number 3 uh relatively recently about 6 to 7 years ago grandmaster venkatesh from chennai he is my friend he had a training camp with driv in moscow so he told me the story driv kind of taught him the secrets of the slav defense driv is a extreme specialist great specialist of the semi slav especially so in many positions venkatesh would ask but what is that to play in this position driv would say there is so much to play in this position look at the position more closely look at all the nuances there are so many small small details here from which you can generate so many ideas right driv's place was play was extremely subtle deepest positional understanding mm. you can say this is one of my most favorite players he also published a book of his own best games yeah i consider it as one of the best best books i have read sure. actually wow. very good book yeah you know the thing is i feel in the modern era there are uh, players who approach the game differently who are built up on engines they look at the evaluations and they understand with that while in the past they looked at chess in a different way so do you think that all these modern gms who are coming up young who are very strong would benefit if they spent some time with uh, these very different thinking players because that would add a dimension to their uh, play which would be very unique now because uh, the engines are playing such a predominant role in our game see i would like to i of course fully agree with you and i would like to qualify your viewpoint with another in my opinion analysis by the engines for the sake of opening preparation it doesn't apply to 95% of chess population whereas about 70% of chess population feels that they need engines to analyze chess Actually, Matthew Sadler has written two great books. Yeah, the Game Changer and uh, the Silicon Way to Chess Improvement. Brilliant books. You will learn a lot about chess itself if you go through these books. I think that is what, short of super G, short of twenty six hundred, twenty seven hundreds, you still can learn a lot of chess by studying engines, but not by using chess engines for opening analysis. This is what I strongly feel. Mm. So there's this next. and one one more game uh, which is kramnik versus lanka uh, and what's so special about this game actually this is one of my most favorite games throughout the game don't do anything just apply your knowledge of basic principles to the position almost every you know it's as if we i mean kids do it at school no carry in my in my era, i don't know what happens today cheating in exams used to take place by carrying small bits of paper so for example you need not write the whole answer but just the typically for history guys would note down uh, you know which year was the sepoy revolution which year was the start of the mogal empire which year was the harshavardhan ascended to the throne just the year they will write Once you see the year, you can write the answer very easily. This game is about. It's as if Krabnik put a textbook of middle game next to his table mm. and just followed the rules. And black gets bothered. See, mind you, when this game was played, uh, Zigurds Lanka was still a very strong player, player one of the best GMs, uh, one of the best professional GMs in the world. Right. Just see how white just bothers black. Amazing textbook play. This word textbook was used by Yasser Sirwan when he announced the arrival of Kramnik on the world scene in Inside Chess magazine. You know that word stays in my memory forever. Whenever Kramnik plays one of these games, that's the word textbook style of playing middle game in chess. Textbook is more like you know uh, just sticking to these basic principles. Maybe when we used to look at games of Capablanca or let's say Stenitz and all of them, the clarity which were there in those games. was because of maybe not very strong opposition at that point you know uh, and maybe it was becoming increasingly difficult to create such instructive masterpieces perhaps kramnik was able to do that quite a lot yeah and of course he had tactical vision too yeah brilliant tactical vision too 
So c5 hitting the center again once we once again we have the king's indian d5 yeah. knight to e5. Actually, this was a novelty by John Nunn somewhere around 87 or 86. This was a very new move at the time because you know you are moving the same piece again. That too with black pieces, that too in a risky opening. That was his opening novelty. Kramnik played so beautifully in this game. Like effortlessly, he treated this novelty as almost like a bad. You are moving your same piece twice in the opening. Come on, it's as if he's telling his opponent. You know, like here you can't push because there is knight g4 and you lose the key bishop here. So just yet the knight on e5 is very well placed. So bishop g5 was played. See, this is the point. Now when I play f4, there is no knight g4 because of h3 and the knight gets modeled. Right. So he played knight d7, bishop h6. Yes. I, Have you ever seen the same piece moving thrice in the opening? Yeah, exactly. Before I mean, the 10th. Bishop e3, bishop g5, bishop h6. But the justification is knight d7 to e5. Knight g8 to f6 to d7. Correct. I have a justification and I have a space advantage. And now I have created dark square weaknesses on the king side for black. Beautiful. So takes. And now he wants to play h4, h5, the attack. So uh, first of a6, course. h4, and f6, an important move because if h5, then g5 kind of traps the queen. So, See, here I would like back. to say something. It looks as if it's all part of a great grand scheme by Black. He has exchanged the Dark Bishop. He has the King's side weak, but he has a plan. He's going to go with a Knight to F7. And you still White as a Bishop on F1, which is kind of restricted by his own pawns. Yeah, C4, D5, E4 and all that. Hmm. So, the resultant middle game is actually not so easy. Today, sitting with our engines, we know that it looks very easy. But the way Kramnik played this game was beautiful further, further on from this point onwards. Queen f5, f4, attacking the knight. The knight had to move back. Knight so, to this f3. is the first triumph, you know. Look at the knight on f7. It is restricted forever. I think he could have gone and sat here, but uh, it's doing nothing much on the g4 square. Exactly. And could be under attack. So he went back, knight f3, rook b8, planning b5, but Kramnik sort of nips it Stop in it. the bud. Stop it. Exactly. Now it's almost as if everything is ready. Black can't do much. From this point onwards, white starts playing. Bishop g4, he kicks the bishop away. b3, <laughs> kind of yeah. solidifying everything. King h8, and now castles. A bit, bit surprising, you know, like I would have thought he would use his rook or down the h-file, play g4. Nothing fancy, no drama. Just follow that cheat sheet you have next to you, follow the principles, that's about it. So now his plan is to play uh, knight c7 and b5 at some point if possible. Uh, he went queen b2. See, this is it, Sagar. You have a plan with black pieces, but does white really have a plan? I don't know, maybe he's aiming for e5 break or... Uh... Maybe, but when you come to whenever white comes knight of three, black goes bishop g4. So the e5 square, he kind of keeps under control. See, this was the point where we should ask ourselves the question, where is white's breakthrough is going to come from? Knight f3, he played bishop g4. And yes. Kramnik here, uh, I think, used his tactical prowess and broke through e5. And this I think is... if bishop f3, if you take back, then you lose the e5 pawn. So you can't like if you if you go rook f3, uh, maybe fe, fe and knight e5, and I guess black is doing okay here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But he took here. See, that is the next thing. Look what he did. He did that exactly when the knight is on e8. Mm -hmm. Look at the timing. Maximum benefit of opponent's crampness and some kind of a development disharmony. I mean, the queen on a5, the rook on b8, the knight on a8. Yeah. Kind of out, you know, out of focus from the game. And then he breaks the center. Beautiful. So, you have to save the bishop, fe, and then uh, rook g7, the knight comes in, the queen is looking down the long diagonal. Uh, and now we know why he played queen b2 three moves ago. Correct. Yeah. correct. This diagonal was so important. Knight of six attacks the bishop. Bishop is saved, but soon it can get trapped with g4. But Kramnik doesn't want to win. In, I mean, win the piece or anything. He goes rook e1, knight e8. There's bigger things to win. Knight e7, rook a8, and f5. Wow. And this position, okay, the board is a little chaotic. Otherwise, you would say it is Anatoly Karpov is playing white. 
look at all the pieces all towards the center all coordinating with each other and no counter play except for the peace sacrifice part it is arundhati part right so now threat is fg and then f7 and there is this pin down this diagonal so you went g5 takes knight uh, g5 if you don't mind uh, can we just go back to the point where rook a even was played just just go back yeah here yeah we, yeah here white is getting the piece back with g4 but correct. he doesn't bother correct you know peter swidler in one of his commentaries said this in many positions it's a very useful question to ask yourself what would anatoly play in this position what would karpo do here you know such questions provided you know what is karpo and you know what are the great subjects such questions always help you understand something about their play the most significant arsenal in the romani and basically that is where you realize that it is not necessary at all to go back for the piece because your e sword pawn is too yeah. strong just break the rook to e1 things will take care of themselves beautiful play i think it's very important to look at such games so that when you play you can also try to play it that way because many times we are so materially oriented right from a young age we are talking about you know piece is worth 3 points pawn is worth 1 point ah. that it doesn't change in our psyche for a long time and when you look at such games you understand that what is activity what is a pawn on 7th rank and so on so knight d7 rook a8 f5 g5 takes takes and pushes the pawn to f6 now f7 is coming up so he had to block bishop f5 with the idea of bishop e6 knight c7 and he goes knight f8 i think kramnik is just enjoying himself yeah yeah, yeah. this is like <laughs> real enjoyment at six one of those 19th century games also do you, do you see like he i mean my first intention always comes to like forcing moves like bishop e6 but kramnik is just building it up you know he brings his another rook to e3 b5 g4 now yeah that was the idea of playing rook e3 take g takes h5 c3 rook takes knight takes d5 rook d3 c4 pawn takes yeah the final the final hurrah for black d4 takes takes knight e3 bishop g6 king g8 and rook d6 and finally he resigns because now rook d8 is coming up and essentially you are not even material down i mean you are now just what three points up actually you know black could have resigned long ago maybe 15 minutes ago 15 moves ago or something because the portion of scope was in yeah so the last 15 moves were not very you know instructive or anything but overall this game made a very big impression on me because of just following the principles part so yeah. vladimir kravnik at 1992 Man- manila olympiad was amazing i don't know if anyone else has made an entry into the big stage this way and you know, it's like you watch one of those salman khan rajini khan movies and <laughs> what the entry scene comes you know it is like one of those entries like that yeah and i think from this olympiad is when people took note of kramnik and then he went on to of course dominate the world of chess so once again it it's like these olympiads prove to be the ideal ground for new talents to be spotted uh getting the opportunities and it's amazing i i think there are a couple of pictures that we have of kramnik which we can see before we end this uh this is one oh yeah that's so smart the you know <laughs> the viviciousness the viviciousness of the youth mm. and this one oh of course yeah again yeah. uh these are those soviet pieces yeah these are those famous soviet uh, chess just says that he is he's sitting he's so like when you when you meet him uh, have you, have you ever met him in person yeah yeah of course he's he's like 6 feet some 62 or something tall and uh always, i mean i was lucky enough to spend time with him in these microsense camps uh which were held in switzerland and i mean france and also in chennai and uh, it was tremendous the way in which he uh, guided the youngsters of indian chess the way he was kind of sharing his knowledge and it was again this one quality which i keep seeing so much in these world champions 
that when they have something with them like this, they want to share it with the youngsters. This we saw with Botvinnik, we saw it with Kasparov, we see it with Anand who is doing it with Westbridge Anand and also the same with Kramnik and it didn't even matter that, you know, they were from which country. It's just like talent recognizes talent, you know, that way. Uh, I have spoken with a couple of boys who attended those uh, sessions by Kramnik and Gelfand. They both told me the same identical thing. What struck them the most about Kramnik was the depth of how much he sees in a position. You know this, right? One of the principles of Kramnik is you become a super strong player that is beyond a grandmaster. You become a super strong player by learning to calculate when you cannot calculate. When apparently there is nothing on the board to calculate. This is basically you become very strong players, learning learning to calculate. But in the process, these two boys who attended told me the most important quality, the chess principle they learned from him was the depth to which he sees the position. Mm. And they say even now he has insights about any position which an engine cannot offer because sure. the engine offers only the perspective in the current position, whereas Kramnik sees the future. This is a position in which this pawn and this knight will dominate for the entirety. Keep this position and keep playing your opponent will card. Don't yeah. bother about the 0, 0.00 advocated by engines. I agree. This was something very profound and, you know, very lucky for such wisdom that it reaches our youngsters at such an early stage. You know, I think Kramnik and Gelfand have done a very good service for Indian chess by doing those camps. Uh, Hopefully, I, they will continue also. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's one part in those camps where the kids would come to Kramnik with their uh, doubts. and or, or mainly they would say that I struggle with this, I struggle with that. And Kramnik would not answer immediately. Because uh -huh. he would say that what if you yourself have not recognized what your problem is. And so he would say I need to see your games properly. Because oh. it's not like he would say I struggle with time trouble or someone would come and say I struggle in converting advantages and he is not giving the advice to that. He's like, okay, let's see the games. Maybe there is something else. You have not diagnosed the right problem and that was very interesting to see. And you know about Scramnik sense of humor, yeah? That's also quite famous. Uh, you know, in New Inch Chess Magazine, you have this last page where you check out facts of people, just, you know, one-liners. Who is your favorite actress? What's the serial you are watching? Right. What's the best book you have read? And so on. So there are these two questions for which Karnik answered. One, if not yourself, whom you would have been in this life? The answer was, overall, I think the male lives have it the best in this world. <laughs> what? Which one? Male lives. Lions, oh. <laughs> you, you don't need to hunt and you get your prey <laughs> food anyway. And the second, this was too much actually. Who is your favorite player? Who is your favorite actor? Gary Kasparov. <laughs> 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 that was like real fun. There was one more too, but you know, obviously that's an inside joke probably. What is the best chess game you have ever witnessed? And the answer was something like Gary Kasparov versus Kirzan Ilimjino, Moscow 1996 or something. The inauguration of the Olympic. <laughs> I, I would love to meet someone what they played in that opening post. Obviously, it was a it was an inauguration ceremony. So I would really like to. <laughs> this is one of the I think we should end the day today with a very good joke. I know. This is the best practical joke I've ever heard about inauguration functions. So this was told by one of the journalists of the Hindu newspaper. So they had a national championship in Andhra Pradesh. So they had called one of the ministers for inauguration. So the minister came. He was asked to give an address. And he gave all the correct words he spoke. You know, chess is a great game. It's a game of intellectuals. I also played chess in schools and colleges. I also enjoyed my competitions. You play chess, your brain. Yes. Chess was originated in India, went to Iran. All that is. Audience, though, you're used to clapping, right? So you clap. And finally, he was asked to come to the chess board and inaugurate. He said, of course I will. Came to the board, took his hand near the roof to H1. Patak, he gave a shot with his hand. <laughs> I would, I can never forget this. <laughs>
mind you, this is not a this is not a story. The the journalist <laughs> you told me was actually there when it happened. <laughs> this this did not happen. Come on. <laughs> I have met. If you want, I can name the journalist. I, I'll not do it in the in the yeah. history. Okay. I, Afterwards, I'll I have got an idea of who, who it is, but but this like you know, it okay. actually happened. I mean, <laughs> but tag the guy somewhere, somewhere confused carrom board and chess, which probably both of them he never played in his life. And there you go. It's amazing how we started off with. This with Kramnik, the, the man who had the deepest understanding of where the pieces belong, and ended it with 